Welcome to Active Love Church, real life groups going through chapter 4 of The Story by Max Lucado. And we're so glad that you've joined us today, whether you're watching this online independently or one of our life groups. Uh, we thank you for taking the time to, to enjoy this message today, this teaching on how God brings deliverance to his people. So chapter 4 of the story is called Deliverance, and this is still within our mini-series called A Light in the Darkness. And we're learning about how God always provides a light in the darkness uh, when time seemed the most bleak, as it did for the Israelites who were under harsh slavery in Egypt. God provided a light. Uh, he provided a way out. And uh, he does that time and time again in the Bible and time and time again in our lives. Okay, so we've been using this icon of the, of the glasses, bringing things into clarity, um, bringing us a clear picture. Uh, anytime I uh, want to present to you a biblical truth or a way of understanding the Bible such that the Bible will make more sense to you. In the chapter on Abraham, the biblical truth that we brought into focus that affects your interpretation of the Bible came from Genesis 12 verses 2 and 3 in which God said that, his desire and his plan is that through his chosen people, the Israelites and now the church, that he would bring a blessing to every family on the earth. And we have to keep that in perspective as we read through the Old Testament, where we read through things that would be very foreign or uh, odd to us in our uh, day and age today. In the chapter on Joseph, we spent some time talking about uh, Judah's life and how the Bible has many things that are both uh, normative and informative. And we need to take the meat, the normative parts, and make that a part of our, our life. But we need to take the bones, the informative part, where we find out how sinful the people in the Bible are, how real they were, and we need to uh, appreciate those so that we understand God's measure of grace, but we don't need to apply those to our life. We need to take the informative parts uh, and, and uh, take them just as information, not as foundation for our life. Today, the part we're bringing into focus here is that God, time and time again in the Bible, reveals this salvation pattern. So that salvation pattern, as we talked about last time, is essentially that the people of God, they would experience a time of prosperity, where they would... Uh, have God's blessings and they would be thankful to God for those blessings and they would live in harmony with God but over time they would become prideful they'd begin to worship idols they would fall away from God they would begin to sin against God and so God would allow them to come into bondage of some type so that uh, they could basically receive the discipline that they needed to return back to God and the people would recognize their plight and they would begin to cry out to God and God would raise up a savior of some type, whether that be a judge or in this case Moses. And of course in the future our ultimate savior would be Jesus uh, to redeem them from that situation. But that redemption has a cost. It's not something that's free or easy. Okay, so we're going to find out about the redemption in this story in a bit. And then finally there's a deliverance. And allows them to return back to that time of prosperity where they're living right with God. So let's look at that pattern specifically as it applies to the life of Moses and the lives of the Israelites in Egypt. So if you recall from chapter 3, Jacob's family moved down to the area of Goshen under the blessing of Joseph who had risen to power within Pharaoh's uh, government. And we didn't look very closely at Goshen last time, but the Bible actually says that Goshen was the best land of Egypt. And here in this very simple map, you can see why. Goshen is at the uh, end of the Nile River that opens up into these deltas, these very fertile uh, areas of land. And so the Israelites were able to prosper there. It says that when Jacob came down with his sons and their wives and their children and their servants, that all told it was about 70 people and their family that moved to Goshen. And yet over this period of somewhere around 400 years, they multiplied into a number of just 600,000 men, which if you consider possibly uh, you know, four people per family, then that would have been 2.4 million 
uh, people living in this area of Egypt. And you can imagine then that uh, the Pharaoh would become very fearful that if there were ever to be a conflict that they would not be able to subdue uh, these, these foreigners in their land. So at some point in time, Pharaoh made them slaves in order to control their prosperity and their uh, population. We don't know exactly when that happened within that 400 year period. And then as it grew worse, as their numbers continued to grow despite harsh conditions, Pharaoh even decreed strict population control where the midwives and later the soldiers would be required to kill any newborn male babies uh, born to these Hebrews. So we see that the Israelites did experience a tremendous amount of prosperity for an extended period of time and it was all according to God's prophecy. So let's speak a little bit more about the context that they were in in Egypt. Okay, this was sometime around the period of around 1800 to 1400 BC. Egypt was extremely prideful and this was in part because they knew that they were the strongest country in the lands. In fact, it tells us in Genesis 47 that they actually owned much of the surrounding property, cattle, and even people uh, around Egypt because during the famine, it tells us in Genesis 47, the people came to Joseph and asked to buy grains and then the next year they came back and they said, well, we don't have any more money, we've already given you our money, but you can have our cattle, you know, our livestock. And then the next year they come back and they say, well, you already have our cattle. And, and Joseph says, well, give me your land. And so they do that. And the next year they come back and they say, well, you already have our money, our cattle, and our land. And Joseph says, well, you can be my, my slaves. Essentially, you can sell me yourselves. And then after that, he puts taxation on them. And he says, every 20% of everything that you harvest needs to come back to the Egyptian uh, government. And so you can see this consolidation of power. Uh, you can see the building up of the pride of Egypt. But not only that, they were also very occult. Egypt, as we know, was a very pantheistic society. They worshipped the sun god, you know, the, the god of the harvest, the god of rain, the, you know, the god of the earth. And they had all these different gods. But they also had god kings. Pharaohs themselves were seen or believed to be gods on earth. And so you can see a conflict that's going to be brewing in the land of Goshen who believed that there was only one true God, Yahweh, and that he was all-powerful even over Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh obviously would not have liked that. To make matters worse, we know that the Egyptians had a very low value for human life. It's not for certain if they were practicing human sacrifices at the time of the Israelite occupation, but we know for sure that Pharaoh ordered the execution of all the newborn Israelite babies. So clearly they had a low regard for life. But just remember that God actually predicted all of this and told Abraham exactly what would happen in Genesis 15. None of this was outside of God's control or plan. God had a plan to raise up a people and that he would deliver them from their bondage so that he could establish them as a new nation. And he does that by calling a savior. Uh, not a literal savior, but Moses is regarded as one of the, the most uh, powerful prophets and leaders in the Bible. In fact, in Deuteronomy 34, it says that no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, and who did all those signs and wonders the Lord had commanded him to do in Egypt and, of course, also in the wilderness. So Moses has one of his own Cinderella stories where God takes the seemingly uh, impossible situations and works them out for the betterment of all of us. When Moses was born, in order to save his life, his mother put Moses in a basket in the river and... His sister follows the basket from a distance, and as God would have it, Pharaoh's own daughter finds the basket, pulls Moses from it, and asks his sister if she knows of any nursing Hebrew mothers who can become the nurse for this newborn baby. So Moses goes from nearly being executed to literally being raised in royalty in the house of, of Pharaoh, but later on, 
Moses having compassion for his people, uh, commits murder against an, an Egyptian, hides the body, but in fear for his life, he ends up fleeing from Egypt, becoming a desert rat, where he becomes a shepherd, he establishes a family in the land of Midian, and he's quite comfortable there. But God reveals himself to him in the story of the burning bush, and God calls him to go back to Egypt to, to demand that Pharaoh let his people go. And of course, you know the story that Moses had many excuses. In fact, he even just outright asks God, please send somebody else. And God reaffirms him with signs and wonders and promises that he will be able to do miracles in the sight of Pharaoh and, and the, the Israelites so that the Israelites would believe him so that God's purposes would be accomplished. So eventually, Moses does submit. He becomes the reluctant rescuer. He goes to Egypt. He begins to make the demands of Pharaoh. He begins to ready the people of Israel. But he needs to use the power of God to do this. Now, did God take an active role in hardening Pharaoh's heart? Or was that a side effect of Pharaoh's heart's condition to be proud, boastful, to be claiming he is his own God? It's possible that God actively hardened Pharaoh's heart and changed his mind because we know from many places that God says that it was his desire to make a spectacle of Egypt so that the surrounding nations would see the power of God and help usher the Israelites into the promised land. And that was effective because we know that when the Israelites reached Jericho 40 years later, it says in the book of Joshua that Jericho was shaking with fear because they knew that the Lord was fighting for the Israelites. That story of what had happened to the Egyptians survived another generation to get to Jericho and they were still in fear of the Israelites. But it's also possible that God didn't need to take an active role in hardening Pharaoh's hearts. And let me give you an illustration of this. Let's say that you're in a room with God himself and because God is light and God is love that room is being warmed by God's presence. You are feeling, you're basking in the presence of God and everything is good. But if you ask God to leave, then God has no choice because you have free will to respect your request and to leave that room. And with him goes that light and that love and that warmth. And what is left? Cold and dark, right? And so if you're cold, if you are hard-hearted, if you are closed-minded, if you are lonely, if you are sad, and, it, and you have already asked God to leave you, to leave you alone, to leave you to your own devices, then is that God's fault that you're cold? No, it's, it's actually your fault because you've chosen to not have a relationship with God and to be with God. So God's just respecting Pharaoh's request here to be his own God. All right then, what's left? That he, that he would be hard to heart, that he would be vengeful towards anyone who claims to be a higher authority over him. So the last of the plagues, it, it deserves a little more explanation as well. God sometimes uses irony. You know, we just talked about how in the beginning of the book of Exodus, Pharaoh ordered the death of every male newborn. But now at the end of the plagues, we see God using Pharaoh's own decree against him. In a more merciful way, might I add, that he wasn't decreeing that every child be killed or every male child be killed. Instead, he was saying the firstborn of every family and every livestock. And that seems very harsh to us now as we uh, live in the age of grace and of love. But God was speaking to Pharaoh in a language that Pharaoh would understand. More than that, God later established a system of justice, which we sometimes summarize as eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. We don't actually have a lot of evidence that the Israelites took this literally. But what God was doing was establishing a system of justice where the punishment meets the crime. Okay, the two are in balance. Versus a system of justice where... Uh, the government could do whatever they wanted, or that uh, everyone did what they saw was right in their own eyes. Right? That ends up in a system of abuse, 
where the punishment does not meet the crime. So God was being actually merciful in creating a balanced system of justice. Now we see God applying that system of justice to Pharaoh for his previous decree about killing the children of God. Not only that, but God also warned Pharaoh through Moses that this would happen. God gave Pharaoh a chance to change his mind and to repent, and that he could have let the Israelites go, and this whole Passover event would not have occurred. However, it wasn't God's plan, and God even predicted that this would occur before Moses even set out to return to Egypt. After God had sufficiently established this salvation pattern, it was no longer necessary to hold to such a tight regiment of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Instead, Jesus ushered in the age of grace, where it's not about fulfilling the law, but it's about realizing that you are sanctified and forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Therefore, we can have that same forgiveness and love for other people. So Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, he says, You have heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you that you should love your enemies, and if they strike you on your cheek, you should turn and offer them your other cheek, and they ask you to go a mile, you should go two miles. And so Jesus uh, turns that on its head a bit. He's not saying that there isn't room for justice. Jesus isn't repealing the judicial system or the or corporal punishment, but he is saying that we need to extend our love even to our enemies and even to those who are against us so that they might be one for the Lord. So there was a plan to rescue the Israelites, but there still had to be a payment. This is in the salvation pattern that there is a redemption for your soul. Redemption, we typically think of as just in terms of salvation, but it's actually a financial term to say, I have redeemed you. This definition number two here says, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or a clearing of a debt. When you sin, you have a debt that needs to be paid. And you can pay that with your own life and be separated from God, or you can accept that Jesus has already made payment for you with his own blood and be reunited with God. This idea of blood being the payment for our sins to be the covering of our sins comes from Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. And this is why the Jews implemented the sacrificial system, using the life of an, of an animal as a substitute for their own life. And then eventually Jesus fulfilled that sacrificial system, saying that I am the sacrificial lamb. And no longer, Hebrews goes into great extent saying that it's no longer necessary to continue to sacrifice animals because they couldn't truly forgive sins. Only Jesus himself could truly forgive sins. So in this rescue plan, God instructed the Israelites to paint their doorposts with the blood of a sacrificed lamb. And during the tenth plague, the angel of death would pass over Goshen and they would, it would see the blood of the lamb for, uh, being a foreshadow to Jesus and pass over their homes. But anywhere where, he, where the angel of death did not see the blood, the firstborns would be killed. Later in the scriptures, Jesus is referred to as the Passover lamb. So this story of the tenth plague is actually just a type and a shadow, is foreshadowing the sacrifice of Jesus and how he is the redemption, he is the payment necessary for us to be free from the bondage of sin. But even after we've been redeemed and we are instantly saved, there is a process of sanctification where we must be delivered from all of those things, all of that baggage that we had in our lives prior to our salvation. And that is a cooperative process. We have to work together with God. We have to be obedient to God. We have to be allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us in order to uh, cleanse us of our unrighteousness. This chapter on deliverance ends where it began. God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, and he told Moses that his people would worship him 
on Mount Horeb. At the end of this chapter, in Exodus 17, we see that fulfillment where it says that the people were grumbling against God because they were thirsty. And so God told Moses to take the staff, strike the rock, and water would gush forth and, and satisfy the people. Where were they when that happened? They were on Mount Horeb. God had fulfilled his promise in delivering his people and bringing them back to the place that he had for them. But isn't it interesting that throughout this whole reading, God had been doing these powerful miracles to deliver his people. And in the wilderness, in the next chapter, we're going to see that God continues to do powerful miracles in order to sustain them and bring them into the promised land. And yet, throughout it all, the Israelites grumble against God and against Moses. We are a difficult people to keep satisfied. There are people here today who say, if God would just show himself, if, if G Jesus would just make a, a miracle happen for me, then I would know and I would believe. To this I say that that is not true. The Israelites had miracles performed for them every day through the delivering of manna and quail and water for 40 years. Their clothes never wore out. They had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And, and yet they still grumbled against God. And in fact, the end of this chapter, they say, is God with us or not? How rude. Of course God was with them. God was showing themselves every day to them. So what do we learn from this? Miracles are not sufficient to grow faith. In fact, an abundance of miracles can make us even skeptics. Instead, what we need to do is not seek the miracles and not seek the gifts, but we need to seek the giver, God himself, Yahweh. And when we know Yahweh and we know that God is good and that he know when we know that he only wants good and perfect gifts for us, then we can begin to trust in him even when we don't see miracles because we know that God is working for us and it's only a matter of time before we see God move the mountains in our lives. We see this again in the New Testament. The Pharisees said, Jesus, if you would perform a miraculous sign for us, then we would know that you are from God and we would, we would believe in you. Jesus rebuked them and said, you'll see no sign for me except for the sign of Jonah. And he was referring to himself being in the grave for three days and then being sprung out of the grave with new life as he is resurrected. Our memory verse today is Exodus 13:3, where he says, Commemorate this day, the day that you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. This is the goal of Passover. This is what God has commanded his people to do year over year, so that they would remember what God has done for them. Here's your memory verses. Uh, please review them. Uh, this way we continue to stay in the Word and, and build up a, a growing body of knowledge of the Scripture as we go through the story. And allow me to bless you today. Father God, I thank you for everyone watching this video. Lord, I thank you that you had a plan, even in, then, in the Old Testament, to bring about our salvation. And we see that pattern over and over again, especially in the life of Jesus. And now even today... As we are in our own muck and mire and clay, Lord, you have a plan to bring us out of that. And you have uh, already sent a Savior who is capable of above and beyond all that we can imagine. And now, Lord, <laughs> and that Savior has paid the ultimate price with his own blood to be freed from our sins and to live an abundant life with you. And now, God, we pray for the deliverance. God, whatever it is that we need to be delivered from, however we need to be sanctified, however we need to live righteous with you, God, we know that is a process, a process that you need to work in us and through us and with us. And Lord, we submit ourselves and say, yes, Lord, have your way, Lord. Do in me as you would like so that I can live the most abundant life possible so that I can fulfill the original commission in Genesis 12, 2 and 3 to be a blessing to others, every family of the nation, and that is the light and the darkness for today's day and age. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.